Hey everybody, konnichiwa. Nikki Young here, back with my true crime podcast series, Serial Napper. All right, tonight we are going to be talking about the unsolved murders of four teenage girls who were brutally killed one evening in Austin, Texas in a yogurt shop. Four were arrested at one point, with two being convicted, only to have their convictions thrown out. The 1991 case has nearly gone cold after 29 years. However, there is DNA evidence out there that could break the case wide open. Unfortunately, the FBI doesn't want to share the information around this DNA evidence, and so here we are. This story will enrage you, so hang on to your hat. Before we jump in, I want to talk about tonight's sponsor, and it's a true crime book that I am currently wrapped up in. The book is called Who Took Molly Bish by Sarah L. Stein, which tells the shocking true story of the abduction and murder of Molly Bish. Molly Ann Bish was a 16-year-old American girl from rural Massachusetts who disappeared while working as a lifeguard. Her remains were found three years later in neighboring Hamden County after what became the largest search in the state's history. Her case was profiled on numerous television shows like Disappeared, America's Most Wanted, Unsolved Mysteries, 48 Hours, but still there haven't been any arrests made in this case. It's such a riveting story and the way that the author talks about the criminal profiling of potential suspects and the victimology, it'll have your head spinning. It's very well written and a must read for any true crime addicts like myself, although it might drive you a little bit crazy because the person who did this has still not been brought to justice. I promise you won't be able to put this one down. Buy Who Took Molly Bish by Sarah L. Stein at alliebluemedia.com slash stein. I'll also have the link in my show notes so you can just click on through. Stay tuned halfway through tonight's show as I talk a little bit more about this book. Okay, let's jump right into tonight's case. It's December 6th, 1991, a chilly Friday night in Austin, Texas, or as chilly as Austin, Texas can get. 17-year-olds Jennifer Harbison and Eliza Thomas were working the late night shift at a local frozen yogurt shop located in a strip mall called I Can't Believe It's Yogurt. That night, shortly before the end of their shift, Jennifer's 15-year-old sister Sarah and Sarah's 13-year-old friend Amy Ayers, who were planning to have a sleepover that night, stopped by the yogurt shop to see if they could catch a ride home with Jennifer. Now when I read this, it kind of hurt my heart a little bit because... I imagine that they probably felt a sense of safety and security while closing up because they had four girls there. But they had no idea just how much danger they were all in. Before we jump into what happened that night, let's talk a little bit about these four girls. So there was Jennifer Ann Harbison who worked at the yoga shop. She was a senior at Lanier High School and president of the school's Future Farmers of America program. She was also the manager for the Lanier drill team, the Vikettes, and she was a member of the track team. Before working at the I Can't Believe It's Yogurt store, she worked at an Albertsons grocery store. So clearly she was a very hardworking young lady with a lot of drive, a lot of passion, and a bright future ahead of her. Jennifer's little sister, Sarah Louise Harbison, was a freshman at Lanier High School and a junior varsity cheerleader. She was a member of the Student Council and the Future Farmers of America program. She raised lambs for the Travis County Livestock Show and Rodeo, and she liked to collect rocks and seashells. Sarah's friend, who was going to be having the sleepover, was Amy Lee Ayers, an 8th grader at Burnett Middle School where she was on the yearbook staff. She was in the Junior Future Farmers of America program. All girls seem to have this in common. She showed hogs at the Travis County Fair and Rodeo, and she also won the Arts and Crafts Division of the fair with a needlepoint doorstop. She wanted to be a veterinarian when she grew up. She liked George Strait, and she loved cats. She sounds like she was just the sweetest thing ever. And lastly, working with Jennifer at the yogurt shop was Eliza Hope Thomas, a senior at Lanier High School. She enjoyed reading and country dancing. She wanted to be a veterinarian and a rancher. 
She raised a pig named Stoney as a project for the future farmers of America. Her mother always believed that she would grow up to be a writer. Her principal said that she was into agriculture, mechanics, and excelled at welding and small engine repair. Reading about these four young ladies, I was just blown away by how incredibly smart and hardworking all of them were. It only makes what happened to them that much more tragic. Now, nothing really out of the ordinary happened that night before closing, or at least nothing that would seem out of the ordinary before what was about to happen. However, it was reported that around 9.30 p.m., there was a suspicious individual seen wearing a green army jacket at the shop. The man was in the store for some time. He walked to the back of the store without asking permission. And when another patron asked one of the girl what this guy was doing, she responded by telling him that the man went to use the restroom. It appeared that the man had been in the shop for quite some time, using the bathroom several times during his stay at the shop. The green jacket individual left the restroom and walked to a booth to sit with another man. According to witnesses, the other suspect was wearing a black jacket. He had light hair and stood around five and a half feet. He was in his late 20s to early 30s. The individual had ordered a Sprite. He appeared to be prolonging his stay without really ordering anything substantial. After everyone cleared out of the store, these two individuals stayed behind until at least 10.47 p.m. Then Jennifer and Eliza closed the store at 11 p.m. and rang up a no-sale tag at 11.03 p.m. That basically just means that they have closed up the cash register for the evening and are shutting down the shop. Just before midnight, while out on a patrol, an Austin Police Department officer named Troy Gay noticed smoke rising from the strip mall where the yogurt shop was located. He called in a fire thinking it must just be a simple kitchen fire or something of the sorts, and the fire department responded promptly. Nobody was prepared for what they were about to find. I'm going to lay out the crime scene for you. I'll also post a photo of the yogurt shop layout over on my Facebook page. When the firemen entered the shop, they found the bodies of three of the girls piled atop one another. The fourth victim, Amy Ayers, was found in another part of the shop a half hour later. All four girls had been shot in the head with a 22 caliber gun. They were all naked and bound with their own clothes. It appeared that at least one of them had been raped and the scene had been torched to cover up all of the evidence. According to autopsy reports, Sarah Harbison's nude body was found gagged and with her hands bound behind her back with a pair of panties. Her body was severely charred. She had been raped and shot through the back of the head. A 22 lead bullet was recovered from her brain. Jennifer Harbison's new body was not bound, but her body was found with her hands behind her back. Her body was also severely charred, and she had been shot through the back of the head. A 22 lead bullet was recovered from her brain. Eliza Thomas, her new body was gagged and her hands again bound behind her back. Her body was also severely charred, and she had been shot through the back of the head the same way the other two girls had. A 22 lead bullet was recovered from her brain. Amy Ayer's body was the only one that was a little bit different. Her nude body was found with a sock-like cloth material wrapped around her neck with a half hitch in the back. Her body was not severely charred, but it was covered in second and very early third degree burns, basically over 25 to 30 percent of its surface. She had been shot through the back of the head with that same 22 caliber gun used on the other girls, but the bullet didn't enter the brain. However, a second gunshot of a caliber not specified in the report caused severe brain damage. This bullet exited the right lateral cheek and the jawline. This means that Amy didn't immediately die from the first bullet wound. It appears that she was put in the pile with the rest of the girls, but she was able to crawl out only to be shot again where her body was found a short distance away. It appeared that the killer or killers had collected napkins and other flammable items from around the shop and had doused them and the bodies with lighter fluid before lighting the shop ablaze and fleeing. Autopsy reports showed high levels of a BTU output, which suggests that an accelerant may have been used. They were thinking probably lighter fluid. 
It's believed the girls did die before the fire started. Between the damage from the fire and the water that came out of the sprinklers to put out the fire, a lot of the DNA and evidence was unfortunately lost. However, police did find testable DNA inside of Amy. They collected it. However, tests at the time were not enough to connect the DNA to a specific individual. They also found DNA on the clothing used to tie up Eliza, but it would be several years before researchers could connect the samples to DNA profiles. But we're going to talk about that a little bit later in the story. So during the investigation, it was discovered that two guns had been used to commit the murders, which means that there were probably at least two perpetrators. It was also determined that there was about $540 missing from the store. But to me, in my personal opinion, it's pretty clear that robbery wasn't the main motive here. Maybe it was just an afterthought like, hey, we've already committed these heinous murders. Let's take the money. We may as well. Either way, police didn't have a whole lot to go on. A lot of the evidence was destroyed by the fire and the great work that the firemen did in putting out the fire. Obviously, they had no idea at the time that they were dealing with more than just a fire when they arrived. This was also the early 90s and DNA testing just wasn't what it is now. But the city of Austin, I mean, everyone was rightly terrified. For someone to commit such a heinous crime that seemed so senseless and random, people wanted justice. And the police, well, they wanted to find these girls' families justice, and they wanted to do it quickly. The phones at the police station rang off the hook as tips flooded in. With all of these tips, they actually had about 342 suspects to go through, and they had dozens of false confessions. Yeah, false confessions. People were falsely confessing. So understandably, they were overwhelmed with all of the information that they needed to go through. They started with taking a look at serial killers who were already known to police, um, who might be in the area. I mean, obviously, the scene it didn't look like the work of an amateur. So to start with, they looked at people that they knew were already dangerous killers. And they first set their sights on Kenneth Allen McDuff. McDuff was first convicted for raping and murdering three teenagers on August 6, 1966. He murdered Robert Brand, Mark Dunham, and Edna Louise Sullivan. It was a crime that became popularly known as the Broomstick Murders. That's another case that I would like to cover at some point in the future. Upon release, McDuff was arrested on a series of parole violations, but he was never locked up for any substantial length of time, so he would have been out on parole during the murder of these four girls. So they did look into him for this crime, but they ended up ruling him out, and he actually flat out told police, had I done it, I would tell you, because I'd be proud of it. The following year, in 1992, he was arrested for the murder of a 22-year-old Texan woman, Melissa Ann Northrup. He was implicated in at least three other murders. After being released, he got a job at a gas station, making $4 an hour, and then he took a class at Texas State Technical Chicago in Waco. One year later, he left his job at a gas station, he dropped out of college, and he began killing again. <laughs> this just goes to show you, if you have it in you to brutally murder multiple people, um, even if you're on the up and up and going back to college and doing well at a job, I, you usually have a hard time quitting your old ways. So as a wanted fugitive, he ended up fleeing to Kansas City, but he was eventually captured due to a tip from America's Most Wanted. He was sent to death row, finally, and executed on November 17, 1998 at Huntsville Unit. Before his execution, he actually claimed responsibility for the yogurt shop murders for the murder of those four girls. However, there wasn't any actual evidence to back it up, and police believed that this was just another false confession. Um, it seems like he was trying to maybe make a deal to get some more time alive before being executed by pretending that he had information to share, but police weren't buying it, and he was executed. Thank you. 
I know you guys must be going stir crazy like I am over here during this pandemic. Go grab a copy of Who Took Molly Bish by Sarah L. Stein. It's another unsolved case that will have you questioning everything you know to be true about the criminal system. On the summer morning of June 27, 2000, 16 year old Molly Bish began her eighth day of lifeguarding at Commons Pond in the small town of Warren, Massachusetts. Around 10 a.m., between the time her mother dropped her off and the first swimmers arrived, Molly was abducted. Three years later, Molly's remains were found less than three miles from where she was taken. Now, in 2003, Dr. Sarah Stein joined the search for Molly's killer. In chilling detail, Stein takes readers behind the scenes and into her own investigative files of one of Massachusetts' most challenging cases and uncovers who she believes killed Molly. This book calls for police accountability and transparency. In Who Took Molly Bish, Stein lays bare the struggles real families of missing persons face, even when armed with credentialed experts. Why has the case languished for so long? Why was Stein's top suspect never investigated? Now a renowned investigator, Stein has confronted, interviewed, and studied scores of crime scenes and criminals and must relive the actions of both killers and victims as she attempts to create their profiles and search for that one elusive piece that could solve the crime. By Who Took Molly Bish by Sarah L. Stein at alliebluemedia.com slash Stein. I'll also have a link in my show notes. Now back to the case. Police began to focus their search efforts on young people, maybe in their late teens or early 20s. Maybe it was just a group of kids who went there to take the $540 from the register, but things got out of hand. Through the investigation, they came across a teenager named Maurice Pierce, who had been arrested at the North Cross Mall with a gun shortly before these murders. Back then, this is what the cops knew. There was about 540 missing dollars from the register, there were two guns used in the crime, and investigators were focusing on young people like a 16-year-old kid picked up at a local mall. So, they brought in Maurice Pierce for questioning, along with three of the friends that he was hanging out with that day, Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen, and Forrest Welburn. But nothing really panned out. They interviewed them, but they couldn't prove that the gun was used in the yogurt shop murders because actually the ballistics wouldn't match up. So they ended up moving on to other suspects. And like I said, they had a ton to move on to. They had dozens of false confessions coming in, people saying that they did it, wanting to be attached to a high-profile case like this one, puffing out their chest, trying to gain notoriety. But in order to be taken seriously, the confession had to have some sort of evidence to back it up. And none of these confessions did. Usually the person would eventually give up their false confession, saying that they were just kidding. The investigation continued on with no concrete leads to follow. Nothing was panning out and the families of the victims were getting frustrated. They wanted someone to pay for these crimes and rightly so. Someone had taken their daughters away from them in the most brutal of ways. Then in 1999, almost eight years after the murders, Investigators revealed that they had four real suspects in custody. Forrest Welburn, Michael Scott, Robert Springsteen, and Maurice Pierce, who were all in their 20s at this point. Remember, these are the same four guys who were picked up, investigated, and then dismissed. Maurice Pierce was that gun-toting 16-year-old caught at the mall, but this time, when the new detective spoke with the guys, they got a big break. One of them, Michael Scott, apparently confessed. He said, I remember looking at this girl. I hear the gun go off. I only pulled the trigger once. I hear another gun go off. I think I hear a total of five shots. These detectives got a second confession from Robert Springsteen. He told them that he not only killed one of the girls, he also raped her. Now, I have a clip of these confessions. 
Um, it's really hard to make out, but in the first part of the confession, one of the guys is denying having any connection to the case. In the second half, which I'm so sorry, the audio is absolute shit, but he says he was forced to shoot the girls. So listen up. I will try to make it as clear as possible, but this is, um, it's not the greatest quality of audio. So I actually couldn't include the audio of the second part just because when I put it on here, it it's really bad quality. Like you wouldn't be able to hear anything. But I can give you a couple of snippets um, of what was said. But basically, you know, Michael Scott is saying, I remember looking at this girl. I hear the gun go off. I only pulled the trigger once. I hear another gun go off. I think I hear a total of five shots. Then the detective says, come on, Michael, you're doing good. Tell us. Let's do this today. Let's do it. And Michael says, I remember one girl screaming, terrified. And I remember Robert Springsteen, he actually went on to say that he not only killed one of the girls, he raped her. So basically from the police theory and these confessions, the story of what happened was these four guys planned to rob the yogurt shop. Three of them would go in and then one of them would stay outside as the lookout. But things went too far and they ended up raping and murdering the girls. This was the story that the police were trying to put together. Maurice Pierce and Forrest Welburn, uh, the two other boys implicated in this story, they refused to confess. They claimed innocence, they had nothing to do with this murder, and they weren't going to admit to something that they didn't do, even with those two other confessions. And so the cases against them fell through. There wasn't any evidence to actually link them to the crime, so the charges against them were dropped. But the two who had confessed, Robert Springsteen and Michael Scott, they were tried separately for the yogurt shop killings and both were found guilty of capital murder. Springsteen received the death penalty. Michael Scott was sentenced to 99 years in prison, which is a life sentence. Both later said that these confessions had been coerced, but it was too late to recant. Even though there was not a single shred of DNA evidence connecting either of them to the crime, it's crazy and most of us can't imagine ever confessing to something that we didn't do, but it happens all of the time. We see it happen many times in many big cases. Now, there was a lot that went wrong during their interrogations. One of the detectives on the case was transferred later after he allegedly extorted confessions in an unrelated case. And then a photo came to light of another member of the Austin Police Department pointing a gun at Scott's head during his interrogation. So 15 years after the murders and 10 years after the two men had served hard time in prison came a shocking turn of events. Ultimately, both Scott's and Springsteen's convictions were overturned. The cases were thrown out. Here's why. Everyone is entitled by the Sixth Amendment to confront an accuser, but in the case of Michael Scott and Robert Springsteen, their confessions were used against each other, but they were never allowed to cross-examine each other at their trials, and so their constitutional rights were violated, and there would be a new case. As difficult as this would be for the families of the girls to have to relive all of this and see all of the evidence and hear all of the details, 
This was a saving grace for both Scott and Springsteen. Now remember, Springsteen had said that he had raped one of the victims, but prosecutors got a shock when one of those DNA results came back. As it turns out, DNA from the crime scene did not match Springsteen, nor did it match any of the other men accused of the crime. And so while officially the court said that they believed they had the right men responsible for the crime, the men would not be re-prosecuted until the unknown male connected to the DNA evidence was found. Now remember, at the beginning of this story, we talked about those two mystery men who were seen in the yogurt shop late at night before closing. Everyone else who was at the yogurt shop that day was identified, except for these two men. They have never been identified still to this day. And it is very likely that these two men, who are believed to be the last two people to see these girls alive, are the real culprits. And that DNA evidence that they have likely belongs to one of them. So what are the latest updates in the yogurt shop murders? Well, on December 23rd, 2010, Austin police officer Frank Wilson and his partner conducted a traffic stop on a vehicle driven by Maurice Pierce, one of the four originally arrested in this case. After a brief foot pursuit, Pierce struggled with Wilson before removing a knife from his belt and stabbing the police officer in the neck. Wilson, the police officer, survived his injuries, but he pulled out his gun and he shot and killed Pierce. So clearly Maurice Pierce was absolutely by no means a saint, but was he involved in the yogurt shop murders? I really don't think so. And as for that DNA evidence, well, in 2017, it was submitted to a new kind of DNA profile called Y-STR. I don't really know what that means, but that's what it's called. It's a searchable database and there was a match. Although there was no name attached to the match, this match could identify a possible killer's male relatives and really help police track down the perpetrator. Unfortunately, when the FBI was asked for the information of the person who matched, FBI officials said the information being sought is protected by federal law and is not as significant as investigators hope. So basically, due to this law, the potential DNA match cannot be used to narrow down who the actual killers are. And as of today, this murder has not been solved. It's still a cold case with not much more information to go on. But obviously somebody out there knows something. So keep sharing because cold cases do eventually get solved, even when it feels like all hope is lost. That's it for tonight. I want to once again thank tonight's sponsor. You guys, go grab your copy of Who Took Molly Bish by Sarah L. Stein. If you're listening to me, I know you're into true crime, and the story of Molly Bish is a crazy ride that is so well detailed in this book. I know you're going to thoroughly enjoy it, so go grab it through the link in my show notes. If you want to reach out, you can find me on Facebook. Just search for Serial Napper. I'm also on Apple, Spotify, wherever you're listening to me on your podcast. I'm sure you can find me. Check me out on Twitter at Serial underscore Napper or I'm on YouTube. Nikki Young, Serial Napper, all one word. Until next time, don't be a Dahmer. Bye.